Awesome. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's the middle of August, so it's, uh, it's a tough time to get people here, um, but, we but I really appreciate it. Um, uh, our agenda today is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, the big things that, we, that are coming up, of course, are the OpenWRT Summit, uh, the deadline for that, but uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, introductions, I think everyone knows everyone here. Um, could be wrong on that, but um, Ron, do you you're, uh, do you know everyone here? Uh, no. No? Okay. Uh, mind if we do a quick round of introductions? Sure. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Why don't you start? Yeah, so I'm um, yeah, um, architect and security architect here in Zeta Vault. We are developing a security solution as a application. One part of it is an application on OpenWRT so we can be as hardware agnostic as possible. Um, and that's where I, I really uh, want to see board farm uh, uh, running in our system and also I would really look for uh, um, um, other, other companies like us to Expose what they do and, and, and really look for opportunities for synergies and, and market sharing and such. Awesome. Thank you, Ron. Sultan? Hey, Ron. So, uh, my name is Sultan Herpai. Uh, originally, I ran two targets in OpenWRT, which were the MXS and the SonicC targets. One is for, uh, one is for the, uh, the free scale. IMX uh, CPUs. The other one is for the uh, the uh, the other one. The Sonexy target is for the OpenWinner uh, SOCs. Uh, nowadays, uh, I'm more or less maintaining uh, OpenWRT trunk. So that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, where I am now. Well, thank you, Zoltan. Volter. I'm the architect of uh, the gateway software stack uh, at a company called Soft at Home. We're not using OpenWRT at the moment, but we are looking at uh, seeing if we can converge with the uh, with the open source community. Thank you, Volter. Um, and I think everyone here knows me, but so we will we'll skip my introduction. Um, the I guess uh, next thing, uh, board farm status. Um, I haven't been able to work too much on it this week. Um, we, uh, we have had some people offer to donate boards. We would really appreciate if you are from a company that has a, a device or a board, um, or you have extra ones, we would really appreciate the donations. We are obviously running tests on those and, and we want to add as many devices as possible, preferably as quickly as possible. Um, so uh, I, I did have a problem with one of the QCA boards. Uh, its U-boot was missing um, a number of features. I'd like to avoid trying to uh, to uh, update U-boot if I don't, if I can. Um, but uh, I fixed one problem and then another one came up. So uh, I'll have to talk partly with the QCA folks and partly just kind of debug what's already there. Um, there's were some questions about about board farm i think on the list this week they're nothing like too much detail um but that's kind of where we are with that so uh again if you know of somebody if you have boards if you have if you know of anybody who has extra devices we we really would appreciate them being donated they're going to going to go to a good cause uh certainly hey eric uh, one question around that mm -hmm. so are such boards accepted that, that are, let's say, not in the core interest of, of the Purple Foundation? For example, some MXS and Sonic C boards. Yes, we are accepting everything. That's a that was um, the 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 group uh, is wants that. So that's what we we're going to do. And I think it's a good idea. So. Um, that's great. That's great. And and what's uh, what's easier for you? I mean, if if I'm gonna ship out a board from Hungary, that's gonna cost mm -hmm. a, a boatload of money. Uh, do you accept things like I buy a board for you on eBay and and send and send it over to the to the Purple uh, headquarters, or or how does how does it work? 
Um, right now, uh, I mean, if, if you're going to ship a board from a long ways, I mean, if it's going to be one board, um, it'd be preferable if it was a number of boards if you were going to ship it from a long ways. I mean, I think we could probably cover the, the shipping either way. Um, there are a couple things that we're going to want to know if you know them, because it affects, like, like for example, this, um, this QCA board. I didn't realize this was going to be a problem. So it's, you know, it takes longer to get it working. And there's a couple things you need to get um, to get working to, to actually do the testing. So if you know those things, that's very helpful. Um, I have to come up with that list of, of the questions I'm going to ask if people know them. Obviously, if, if, you know, you're just an individual and you want to post and you want to send it, that's, you know, whatever. If, if you're a company and it's your board, it would be very helpful if you had gave us that information. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know it. Um, so yeah, it generally uh, just get in touch with me um, and we'll give you a, uh, I'll give you an address and I'll ship it to me and, and I'll, and I'll uh, install it as quickly as I can. That's great. Basically, basically that, that list of questions would be helpful for, for yes. any individual or vendor to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to give, to give you boards to build. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Any other any other questions? No, Erica, just a comment. I like I said, I want to be any. Um, for now, I'm trying to be a hardware agnostic, so I just mm -hmm. buy cheap used routers of eBay for mm -hmm. twenty bucks and, and and have variety of them. I mean, does it does it make any sense for you, or you're just looking for new new hardware or relevant hardware? I, I mean, I, some of the people that offered to donate them, I mean, they were um, they were just offering ones that they had sitting around. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be new um, as long as we can flash uh, open WRT and and lead if it's supported either. It's we're fine. So, um, yeah, not really any particular um, requirement that it be new. Um, in fact, in I think a lot of cases they won't be new. Uh, simply because it's a it's a pain in the butt to uh, to they're more expensive. So okay, so we can exchange emails later on. Then. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you you have extra things, we are more than welcome to more than happy to uh, to have them. Awesome. And uh, of course, we're going to do. I'll, I'll do a. Pre I'm doing a presentation today on kind of how we're do handling board farm and how we organize it um, and uh, things we're learning as we go. Um, next, uh, funding open WRT projects. We, uh, have three projects approved. Uh, we had the two that were already approved. Luca has now been officially approved. Um, so we are just waiting on the contract to be signed. Um, uh, Felix, um, they asked just Felix to do, a, um, uh, to uh, do a couple things to his proposal. He's really busy this week, so he can't do that. Hopefully he can get that done next week and we can have it approved and he can start. Um, one thing that, uh, since you're here, Walter, do you, uh, I, I don't know if you want to talk about this um, on the call since it's public, but do you have any timeline on when Soft at Home will have their, your uh, TR69 um, stack available either in the base camp or publicly? No, I'd have to defer to Wojtek for that, and uh, he's off. I, he'll be yep. back on Tuesday, and it's one of the topics that I need to discuss with him. Okay, that's fine. No, no problem. Um, I mean, it, it's it's not a problem because Felix doesn't, have, you know, that the contract hasn't been signed yet. But once he gets started, once he gets signed, I mean, as soon as possible to even have it available would be be good. And also from other vendors, of course, too. So, um, but yeah. So Luca, to in case anyone wasn't sure, Luca is going to work on um, UCI. Uh, there's an, an addition to UCI that is, um, I'm zoning on what it is. I think it's ordering. I could be wrong on that. Or maybe standard headers. I, I don't remember. I apologize. Um, it was something that was needed that, that, was, that at the CWMP me meeting, uh, people agreed upon that was needed. Walter, do you happen to remember what it was? Uh, I know that there was a bunch of things that needed to happen, yeah. uh, but I don't remember if anybody is specifically committed to uh, to anything in, in particular. 
Okay. Yeah, Luca. Luca's uh, proposals for the it's for for UCI um, adding a feature to UCI that was needed, um, that everyone felt was was going to be helpful. Uh, um, yeah, I think might be able to find that back. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I do it, but I'm in the have my presentation on the screen. Um, the uh, and then he's also going to work on once Felix has the you know, the, the first API, um, the first framework out, um, and there's, it's all been agreed upon, then, then uh, Luca is going to work on migrating one of the, the implementations that are open source, which are in the, obviously, like soft at homes, likely, but, you know, whichever one is available and, and is ready. So um, that's, the, that's kind of the plan there. Any questions? All right. Oh, I should also say that we, we kind of have um, the idea that we would like to fund some more projects um, in perhaps it would be nice in the next month um, to to do another round of of asking for um, to project proposals. Um, it'd be kind of cool if we could get it done by, you know, have them approved by OpenWRT Summit. Um, that might not be feasible, so um, we'll see. Um, but we, uh, that's kind of on the, on the radar. Um, we do want to do them about, uh, once a quarter, give or take, uh, it, this one took a little bit longer to get everything approved, partly because, uh, we had all these proposals on TR69. Um, so we had to like kind of merge them all together and work out the details. So that's that, uh, regulatory update. I don't have an update on that. Uh, there's nothing, nothing new there. Um, Open WRT Summit, the uh, deadline for session, session submissions is tomorrow. Um, if you would like to speak at the summit, if you have, um, a, you know, talk about anything related to Open WRT, um, obviously it's, if it's something that is, you think would be valuable to other people, um, it doesn't even technically have to be really Open WRT per se, as long as it relates to it. Um, we may have a proposal from somebody who's, um, hopefully working on uh, the stuff related to buffer bloat and making make Wi-Fi fast, uh, improving Wi-Fi performance. Um, so that relates to OpenWRT, but is not, you know, exactly OpenWRT itself. Um, we are, uh, please, please consider sending it. Um, do you, do, would any of you know if you are going to submit a session just so I kind of have a general sense of which ones are still out there? Um, now I remember that I proposed to do one on uh, maybe virtualization or, uh, or containers, but I didn't get a response from YT because it's away on holiday. So. <laughs> So I'll I'll sync up with him on Tuesday as well. Uh, you said to to uh, confirm that by Friday, didn't you? Yeah. Um, as long as we kind of know that we may we could extend the deadline. Um, we we did that last year. Um, so if if you know that there's like there's something that's sitting out there that it's a possibility, we could consider it. We could extend as long as long as the committee supports that. So, and I don't see why they wouldn't so just so i know okay. though there there's it's okay all right it's a an announcer and a, and a proposal out uh, early next week then awesome great thank you all right um please encourage anybody you know that to that would be interested in this topic um they don't you know they it doesn't um, technically have to be open to BRT. They can be from lead if, if you think that they would be interested or anyone else. Um, all right. Uh, the carrier interest group meeting, uh, just a reminder that is, I think next Tuesday, um, the 23rd, whatever day that is. Um, and that is, we'll probably talk a little bit about the TR69 stuff there, but that um, is going to be led by Voitech and um, gentleman from ADB and his name is is escaping me right now um, 
can't remember what it is, but um, he is – they are going to be the chairs of the committee. So um, I'm just talking about things that are related to uh, carriers um, and any other related um, – related topics so uh, please uh, let me know if if you'd like to be in that meeting I can invite you uh, Eric uh, this is Ron I, I would like to uh, yeah I would like to know more about that I would like to know which carriers what their plans are and also attendees but also the background uh, the background is um, a number of the people that were involved in um, I'm really doing great with names today. Uh, it's the previous group. Vo or Volter, what group was was soft at home in that ended? HGI? Home Gateway Initiative. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The Home Gateway Initiative, a number of, of their, their members uh, decided to move to Purple, and they wanted to get an interest uh, a group together that would focus on topics that are that would be of interest to carriers and P and and uh, the companies that uh, service carriers uh, like soft at home and ADB um, that's kind of the background I'm not sure if we have any actual carriers involved right now um, they've uh, I think uh, I'm not sure yet so um, but that's just kind of the general background. Um, it's it's kind of broad right now. I think they're I think we're working out the mission. It's going to be the first meeting, but um, yeah. Okay, so so send me the invite, please. Thank you. Okay, awesome. We'll do that. All right. And um, any other topics that we want to talk about um, before I move on to the board farm presentation? All right. Um, I will then switch my uh, the um, presentation. Um, make sure I have the right stuff open. Okay. Um, I'll start. Uh, so yeah, this is this was a um, a question that had kind of come up from a couple of the members and people who had been attending to talk about. Uh, what board farm is and how we're using it with purple wrt um it's a uh, it's very it's been really interesting it's been fun to work on um and it's got a lot of potential i think to improve the quality of of open wrt and lead and and other um and potentially other software um the quick overview um is uh it's open so of what board farm is it's open source software for testing functionality of open wrt slash lead based devices uh from qualcomm uh or was created by qualcomm it's not just for qualcomm devices should clarify that um they had they had developed it they were uh gracious enough to open source it and it's it's uh very helpful uh the tests are run on actual hardware that's not always clear to people when i when i describe it um, and that's actually really important, obviously, so you can you know, make sure things boot and, and things like that. Um, Purple WRT runs an instance of Board Farm uh, with the added support for running tests for non-root users. My recommendation is actually to run as root. It's simpler, um, quite a bit simpler. Um, one of the reasons we did this is because we have the we have the idea that we would like to have allow people to connect remotely who are trusted members of the community. That's actually pretty difficult to do um, in a safe way. So we are still trying to kind of figure out what the best way to go about doing that is. Um, so if you want to use the one that Purple's running, uh, it is is at that URL at the bottom. And I'll also um, email this out as a PDF. Um, but it's uh, Purple, Purple Foundation slash Board Farm Branch running. Um, so the first thing is is to understand uh, kind of the terminology and how it how it's all put together. Um, we have uh, DUTs, which are devices under test, and RIGs. Um, and so each device you're testing is called a device under test or a DUT. Um, an example is we have a Qualcomm Atheros DB120. Um, so that is a is a device that's tested. Um, each device under test is connected in a number of ways. Um, its power cable is plugged into a network accessible power strip for doing hard resets of, of the of, 
of the device. Um, there's one cable going from the LAN port to a network port of another device. And for us, we're using Raspberry Pis. Um, I call that the LAN device. Another cable goes from the WAN port to a network port of a WAN device. Um, and it could be connected via, via um, wireless LAN. We don't do that right now, but it could be, um, there's also support for a couple of other um, kind of, uh, you can do particularly like a two gigahertz um, wireless LAN, a, a five gigahertz wireless LAN. You can specify that way to do different tests. Um, there's also a serial cable running from the controller to the device under test. Um, and I'll talk exactly what the controller is in a second. Um, it, the device under test and all the devices that are connected, the WAN, LAN, WLAN is called a rig. Um, I didn't finish this thing here. I forgot to finish it, but I call the W, the WAN, LAN, and WLAN devices the network devices. I'm not sure that's a great name, but it is what I came up with. Um, and we also have a controller that's part of our rig, which is where the test is run from. In our cases, the controllers are the only hardware with external access from the internet. Um, for, and that's for um, testing. Uh, it's for um, authentication and authorization things. Um, that's also where you run uh, the actual command. So just to illustrate what this would look like if you were kind of taken apart, um, it's not quite that nice in our room where we have a bunch of a bunch of these, but um, right now, I mean, that's generally what you would have connected there. Um, and so you have uh, the you kind of have these uh, cables that are going out to the um, that are not plugged into this this device. Those are kind of going out to the internet. It would be out to a switch. Um, the power cable. Um, it's not actually plugged in on this dot, but that would be that would be plugged into the networked power switch. Um, and then you have that serial cable that goes out to the controller. And by the way, if you have any questions, please stop me. So how to run a test? Um, you just SSH into the controller. Um, controllers have, an, have the appropriate configuration for running tests on the rig already put on there. Um, I kind of explain how I do that later. Um, and then you run BFT, um, which is a, the board farm test program. Um, our controllers actually have a helper script to pre-fill the configuration file information um, for the rig, so you don't have to do it at the command line. Um, normally, you would just have to pass in uh, an argument, but it's just for convenience. Um, you can also pass in a kernel, the root FS, or an upgrade image to flash before boot up. Um, that's, norm that's what we do for our testing. Um, and if you don't select a particular test or test suite, it will do basic boot up test and put you into interactive mode. So I will actually um, show you how I do that right now. Um, so uh, I will actually exit out of that because I'm already in interactive mode. I'm already logged into this, this uh, controller. It's the controller for the DB120. Um, and I'm, I'll run BFT interact. We won't flash a, um, a, uh, a kernel or root FS, but you can. Um, and it just starts right there. Um, it's going to go through the root FS boot test, which is just simply restarts the, the device and um, make sure that uh, things are, are appropriate. There's nothing wildly wrong and, and things like that. Um, not really in-depth testing, but just the basics. That takes about three minutes to finish, so I'm not going to watch it um, the entire time, but we will, um, we'll just wait and I will continue with my presentation. So um, interactive mode, it's actually just the interact test. Um, you can have all kinds of tests on here, and, and we do. There's things like testing ping, testing performance, um, you can test uh, what the, uh, it can tell you what um, packages are installed on the router at a particular time. Um, any of those type of things. Um, there's also additional tests that we have for things like um, testing that Lucy, um, for example, or some whatever your, uh, your HTTP server um, that it actually uh, responds when you, when you call it. Um, 
So the interact test is is kind of nice because it's it's a place where you can kind of run all the tests and then connect to the the um, device under test, the LAN and the LAN device. Uh, you can get to the consoles of each of those um, at you know from from a simple menu and then get back. So you can you can kind of switch between these different pieces all at once without jumping into um, without you know jumping into a bunch of consoles on your on your own it's all kind of in one program and then from there you can run tests that are already automated or ones that you come up with on your own on the fly um so when a test isn't working when you run automated tests this is a good place to explore the parts to see what's going on um we will see how far we are in that um that is still running um remote accessibility um, so this is actually relevant to how we how we have uh, we run automated tests and how we would allow uh, trusted people to access the devices. Uh, each controller can be remotely accessed by trusted parties. Uh, currently, that's just a few trusted people on the board farm team um, and Jenkins and the Jenkins, which we use for automated uh, builds and testing. Um, the device under tests are on a VLAN inside an open WRT router with a static IP. Um, and each controller uh, has a particular port on the external router, which is forwarded to the controller's SSH port. It's pretty straightforward in that way. And like I said, we use it for running our external Jenkins build server. Uh, Jenkins logs into the device under test controller, copies over the kernel and the root FS for flashing, flashes, runs tests, and saves the results on the server. Um, so uh, while, oh goodness, um, we will see where we are there. It's still running. Um, let me, kind of hard to see there. Restore, okay. Um, just wanted to show you what Jenkins looks like we have here um, when I show it. Uh, we're currently using Jenkins for building versions of OpenWRT and LEAD, um, managing tests and collecting the results. Um, you can actually explore through our Jenkins, uh, our actual, what our jobs are. They're accessible even if you're not logged in um, to see what they are. Um, you can't modify anything, but that is, that's kind of, um, kind of nice. Um, so we can actually go to like say AP135CC um, that's actually a build, and we build a version of, of, of Chaos Calmer. Um, the reason we actually build is because we do occasionally have to add a package. In the case of the DB120, uh, we had to add a, add a custom package to change the way the network interfaces are set up because of a limitation in board farm related to bridging. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't handle uh, certain uh, pings or, or testing performance properly, um, so we had to do that. Uh, it's there's nothing actually wrong with it. It's just for the way that board farm works currently. It's a limitation. So those are the builds. Uh, back to the dashboard. Here's the the test. Um, you can kind of see the test trend. Um, the format is actually using a. Uh, it uses a format that's very similar to JUnit. So we actually use the JUnit test plugin to kind of show what's happening. Um, it's kind of nice also because you can, if you go to a particular build, you can actually look at the console output. Um, this is a partial one, but you can actually see what the tests were that ran. Um, and you also have the results for the build artifacts, uh, what the test results.json file is, the console.log, um, things like that. Um, currently, each device has a combination, a device build combination. So you have a device and then you have a set of builds. Each combination has its own build job and test job. Um, and I gave that example, the AP135CC. Um, and I'm going to move to multi-configuration jobs in the future. So you don't have to have all these uh, little jobs that do basically the same thing, except for one small build change. Um, but it, when I was getting started, I didn't do that, but it would simplify things in the future. Um, one thing 
I use for managing the build configurations, and I'm not sure if it's if it's a if it's either I, I vary between whether I think it's a great idea or 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 a, or a mediocre idea. Um, it's how I manage the build configurations. Um, it's what Jenkins used to build. Um, it we run a run a script that's called a build.sh, and then the model, and then the version you want to build, and it run it downloads all the um, the feeds, it updates the feeds, um, it copies in a configuration, it runs the build. Um, you also have the ability using this tool uh, to update the configurations from the command line, which is kind of convenient. So you can run, instead of update, you would do prepare. Uh, it would download all the, um, update all the feeds, it would download to the latest Git version, and then, it, then um, you could run menu config, make some changes, and then run update, and then it'll save it out. So in the future, all those builds would have the, um, the proper conf for configuration. Was someone saying something? All right. Um, and kind of here's how it works. Um, it's a, uh, I have this, uh, this package. The models are listed in different uh, directories. Um, and there we have the CC config, CC feeds, um, uh, DD feeds. And in this case, there are actually uh, their feeds here. And those are additional packages that you want to add. And those get, um, we use a, uh, a, sim a symbolic link to get linked in uh, appropriately. And uh, when you run the build or prepare, it, it properly copies all those in. Um, and links properly. So that's the uh, general idea. Um, so how do we get these devices set up ahead of time? Um, every Raspberry Pi needs similar users available, certain libraries installed ahead of time, convenient scripts, etc. And running everything as non-root means you need a lot of permission related changes. Um, more than I would I would prefer. And now you have to do this on three boxes uh, per device under test. Um, when we're doing two devices under test, that's already a fairly significant amount of work. Um, just setting up one box requires about 25 steps. Um, so it's a lot of different, different things that need to be done. Um, so I use Ansible right now to handle management. Um, after you do some configuration on, the, on a Raspberry Pi, you can actually manage all the configuration from Ansible. The changes that need to be made ahead of time are SSH needs to be turned on. Uh, the host name needs to be set. Um, you need to change Raspberry Pi to boot into a console with the Pi Super user already logged in. That's not actually required, but it's convenient if, you're, if it doesn't boot um, or if you have some problems. Um, if you want to be, uh, you want to have a nice, pretty menu, you can use the Raspberry Pi config to actually do some of this. Otherwise, you can just manually do it. Um, Ansible is also idempotent, so running multiple times isn't an issue. Um, that's kind of convenient. It's not like you run a script and um, if you run it multiple times, everything breaks. It, it, you can run it as many times as you want, and it shouldn't break anything. So how is management actually done? Um, you add your Raspberry Pis to the inventory, which is a host in the project root, um, and each dot has its own group in the host file. And I'll we'll actually show you um, the board farm Ansible. Um, so the host file, um, you have a uh, children, the dots, and it has children, and each of these would be uh, the name of your of your model. This is a group. Um, and then for each group, you would have a section in here that has the children, which are the controller and the networked um, devices, which are uh, one's the controller and has a host name. Uh, the network children are the LAN and the WAN, and each of those has the host name for each of them appropriately. Um, and based upon what group it's in, it does um, it, it runs different uh, modifications to the configuration. Um, so if you go to, you can actually see kind of how this is organized and also in group vars. Um, 
the dots is a group, so that's kind of where we put the general configuration. Um, and this has things like which board farm repo you're getting it from. Um, you could have your own repo. This is the one that Purple uses. You could put in your own repo. Um, this is where the config the, the uh, config needs to go on um, on the drive uh, on the uh, on the controller by default, and also where you're getting the controller uh, from. There's a because you have a default um, config which is kind of you're probably not going to use. Um, but uh, we actually have a repository which has a set of these controller configs, which unsurprisingly is is organized by model. Um, and there you have the different uh, configs for the controllers. I probably should show that quick since I'm here. Um, so, uh, here we uh, you have obviously these are the JSON configs, um, and then you have the different directories. Uh, we go to the DB120 and we look at the config.json and it explains you know which one's the LAN device, which one's the WAN device, uh, the usernames, which in this case are all the same uh, because you're just logging in remote or locally to to uh, devices locally and you don't have a it's not a um, it's not a, a it's a local user account, so it's not that serious. Um, and some config some command configuration for connecting to a serial port. Um, I think that kind of describes it there. Um, there's not a whole lot else in there. No, you would have one of these for each controller. Um, if you had one device, you'd only need one of these. You don't need to come up with a with a, a Git repository for them. In our case, we have a Git repository to grab them all. Um, ad additionally, down here we have the testing users, which are different uh, users which which have um, who can run tests on the on a controller. Uh, they and their SSH keys, their their public keys. We then have an admin users, and these are are people who um, they can they can you know pseudo into root and do uh, things that completely modify the. Um, excuse me, modify uh, the controller at the root level. Tester obviously has less functionality. Um, that's kind of the summary there. Um, initialization, management, and reboot. Um, you add in the trusted SSH key for an admin user. It, it, it adds that onto the controller. It adds um, some basic packages. It generally gets your Raspberry Pi into a state where it can be easily managed. There's stuff that you need to need to have done. Um, and you would run this command on top, the ansible slash playbook dash i host, init.yml-e, -e, and then host key checking false, and then dash k dash k, um, because you're going to be logging in as with a password in this case. Um, we're going to, obviously, once we or, or uh, once we run init, we're going to then t it removes the ability to log in via password because that's insecure. Um, if you want to init a single dot, you put in limit in the name of the dot, um, the, its group, um, which would be DB120, for example. Um, and if this fails, then you should add in this dot dash SSH common args. This is, seems to be, at best I can tell, a little bit um, intermittent when it and I'm not entirely sure why. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't uh, without that. So that's kind of your backup. Uh, Ansible is a little weird with uh, how it handles SSH when the keys don't match. And in the case, if you've never logged in before, the keys won't match to your, your computer. I should mention that all these Ansible um, playbooks, I just run those on my laptop. And the only way I can, I can get access to um, not just the controllers, but all the devices, I need to be inside the local network that, for security reasons. Um, so that's kind of how I how I go about doing that. Obviously, or of course you could do it different ways, um, but whatever meets your needs. Management uh, is simpler. You just do iHosts uh, or you do uh, site.yml. 
Um, I'm not going to go into details of all those things. It sets up a bunch of roles which relate to packages, uh, different users available, service, startup scripts. Um, it gets the latest version of board farm and configuration. Um, it varies based upon whether it's a controller, it's a LAN or a WAN device. Init basically runs uh, just the most basics that would work on any device that'd be relevant. Um, site actually runs basics in case you have updated the basic init. Um, it will run that as well, but uh, init is really intended to be used by itself when you don't. Um, primarily, you don't have uh, a trusted SSH key yet, and you have to deal with passwords. You could theoretically, uh, for the first time, run site um, just with a password. Um, there's the same way you could do dash k dash k and and uh, the different uh, environment variables. Um, I don't think it makes any sense because you don't really want to do that. You shouldn't. You should be logging in with an SSH key anyway. So, um, it's a good. I think it's a good habit to separate the two. Um, and if you change your Ansible playbook, you can uh, just run this again uh, because it's idempotent. Uh, reboot is uh, we use the reboot script. Um, you use limit here as well uh, if you ever need to reboot your various devices. Um, as part of uh, board farm, uh, when it actually starts up a test run um, and does a bunch of automated tests, uh, it actually uh, reboots all the devices, uh, the WAN and the LAN anyway. So, um, but this is if you had done something separately for management and you had to reboot. Uh, next steps uh, for us is more devices. Uh, e and you can email uh, me, and um, we can we can work out how to get that how to get that done. Uh, more tests, uh, hopefully Wi-Fi. That has been requested a number of times. Um, it, it, there are a lot of issues because that you pretty much have to do that. Um, you know, you, you have to connect wires between the various uh, the antenna inputs and outputs of various devices because we can't have it transmit over the air. Um, particularly when we have modifications of um, if someone could submit their own uh, kernel modification or something and it was a, or uh, a change to how um, CDRA works. Uh, CDRA, yeah. And, um, and it would be running in a way that is illegal in the United States. So we have to be very careful with that right now. Yeah. Hey, Eric. Uh, quick question yep. about uh, quick question about the Wi-Fi stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, while it's understood that you cannot test all aspects of of, of the Wi-Fi chip, but at least a basic uh, asso associate with an with an access point somewhere, maybe on the controller, uh, is that not feasible? Um, maybe. Um. Currently, what we do do is we do actually test that the Wi-Fi, um, you can turn it on and off. Uh, that we do test already. Um, there are tests available already in the test. You can run, add them to your test suite to run Wi-Fi, um, whether you can uh, associate. Um, but I'm not sure that we can actually do that until we, until we over the air. I, I think that's a... It's a little bit dangerous um, because if we get in trouble, we really get in trouble. Um, so I think that realistically something like that probably would need to happen um, after we have a way of connecting them via wire. Um, the people at Imagination did do have a prototype for that. It's more just uh, finding the right time to, to put it all together. Um, but I mean, if you have other ideas, I'm I'm happy to to you know talk about them and learn more about them. So no, no, no. So uh, basically, I was just thinking about that uh, that some basic tests could be run. I mean, obviously not 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 the whole test suite that would need to be done for a Wi-Fi chip, but but even let's say an associate an associate to an access point somewhere uh, would be more more than nothing. But if you say that legally that could be an issue, then Okay, it's, it's okay. I mean, it, it, the question really comes down, like, what if there's something totally wrong? 
with the firmware or something, then we're tr then we're like I, I don't know under some situation we could be transmitting illegally, and then we're like liable for it. Got it. Okay. And, and that that's I don't know. Maybe maybe that's not really a very big risk. I don't know if it is, but um, it's something that is concerning. I think, especially with the way the um, the relationship with the FCC and how they're handling some of these things now um, seems to be a, a pretty strict. So, but it, it, we do need. It's something to think about that maybe there is a way to do a very limited set of tests that might be okay. Maybe you want to set, set up an office somewhere in Malaysia, for example, where this <laughs> not, not, not being taken that seriously. <laughs> do it, do it in Antarctica. Nobody cares there. Something like That's that. Right. <laughs> um, the other thing is running the controller and the network computers and VMs. Uh, Raspberry Pis are, are good for getting set up. And if, if somebody was doing like one of them, I would recommend they do that. Um, but it's not really that great for uh, maintenance. Um, even with six, uh, you know, with with two devices under test and, and six Raspberry Pis, it's already starting to become a maintenance issue because you have little problems like there was a network cable that was bad and it took me a while to figure out why the net, you know, what was wrong, why isn't connecting? Oh, the network cable's bad. Well, you know, if it's connected via VMs, uh, you're not gonna have a bad network cable um, because that's all done uh, in software. Um, you have other problems then, and that's actually, this is how uh, Qualcomm Atheros does their testing. Um, but it it's just an issue of, getting the server, configuring it, having a, a reliable, uh, repeatable way of, of adding uh, these computers as needed and turning them off, doing all those things. So very feasible. Um, we actually are, I'm hoping that I can uh, recruit one of the guys that um, worked on Board Farm originally, uh, Matt McClintock. Uh, he's uh, no longer with Qualcomm um, and I'm hoping I can recruit him for a contract to uh, to actually kind of prototype that and come up with um, with something. Uh, testing a board farm pull requests. This has actually come up a couple times. We've been concerned that uh, people send a pull request and we don't know if it breaks everybody else's um, use case, um, and or that it e if if it even uh, even uh, is um, uh, syntactically correct. Uh, at the very least, we would want to have, uh, they have like static um, checkers for Python. These are all, these scripts are all written in Python. Uh, at the very least, we'd want to do that for testing. Uh, we'd also like to have it actually run on the devices right now to see if anything changes. This is a little difficult because occasionally you have tests that fail intermittently. Um, just be, and it's hard to explain why, and this is, I'm not the only one who's had this experience. Um, so you can't like be like, well, it failed last time. Well, is that really a failure? Or if we run it again, will we get the correct result? Um, and that's, uh, that's part of the issue with that. You can't do it in a totally automated way, but it would be nice to actually check and see if this runs on, on the actual devices before we accept a, uh, a commit, a pull request from someone. Uh, we, we have a website for better handling donations and results. Um, we do have a website or it's a, it's a web page on purplefoundation.org. It'd be nice to have a, 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 you know, nice bright website where you could see, you know, what, what the average success rate is of various routers and devices, um, how the results have changed over time, kind of combining all the stuff that um, already exists. Um, and a little bit more, and then also potentially um, showing off for donors, uh, particularly from companies, you know, say, hey, here's where you can get this, or talk to them to get this, or, or whatnot. Um, uh, opening access to devices to the community, uh, this may have to wait until the VMs are, we have the VM stuff running. Uh, we'd want to give the community access to the controllers to upload their own kernels and root FS um, and or packages or whatever. Um, so they could test them on actual devices. Uh, obviously, even if we have these running in VMs, we have to be extremely careful because if they 
potentially you could up you could overwrite U-boot on these on these devices, and if you do that, then we have a mess because then we have to figure out how to how to uh, if U-boot doesn't boot, uh, then you have a problem. Um, so then you have to try to get you know JTAG and it's it's just a huge huge maintenance headache at that time. So uh, we still have to be somewhat selective at that point. Um, it'd be nice if we could just let people upload anything, but selective members of the community. It could be um, people who are doing some some unique use case and they want to test it on a particular device, um, things like that. Um, and then uh, testing pull requests for OpenWRT lead. This is kind of like the holy grail, I think in some way, would be running automated tests. Uh, people submit a pull request. It can be automatically run on all the all the boards at once. Um, right now, we just do daily tests. Um, whatever's in trunk, we run we run the test every day. Um, it passes or it doesn't, and what tests pass, and that's all we do. It'd be nice if we had a way to do every pull request. So uh, the community that could be added to the um, to the Git repo GitHub repository. Um, as a, uh, I don't remember what they call those, those callbacks, where it can say whether it passes or not. Um, potentially be nice to do. That's not exactly the most straightforward thing because these tests take, um, a daily tests, if we were to run that every time, would take uh, about 15 minutes. So if somebody's doing a pull request uh, and it's something quick, it may not make sense. Uh, you know, you have, you have a, a maintainer who looks at a pull request and then is like, okay, now I have to wait 15 minutes. Um, if, if it isn't a pull request they got to, if it had been sitting there for a while, that's fine. But if it's another one, it might be a little annoying. Um, and if we add more tests, this time increases. So, you know, is it 30 minutes? Is it is it an hour? Um, depending on what the tests are. So um, that's kind of uh, the, the quick summary, the, the 30 minute summary of, of Board Farm. And how Purple WRT is using it. I'm I'm sure I've missed things. So uh, if people have questions, I am happy to answer them right now. Yeah, basically one question from from mm -hmm. me. So um, so the controller stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I, we, uh, we have seen the configs, but what's the hardware behind it? The controller itself. Yep. Uh, it's a Raspberry Pi. Ah, okay. Okay. It's it's a Raspberry Pi. Um, it has a network cable out to the out to the main network, and it has a uh, USB to serial that connects directly to the uh, to the console of the device under test. That's pretty easy. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Very straightforward. Um, yeah. So it it's it's surprisingly straightforward in how it's set up. At the same time, there's a lot of you can always have quirkiness because a lot of the stuff where to verify whether a command succeeded or failed is based upon it runs a shell command on one of the devices. So if your parsing isn't quite right on the regular expression you're looking for um, to whether it responded or, or failed, and that can be based on how the device is set up, it gets a little quirky there. Um, so you're like, well, why isn't this succeed? Well, I actually got a result that was perfectly fine but the script didn't realize it was fine. Um, but that's just the nature of what we're doing. It, it has to be kind of done that way because that's how all the maintenance is done on, on these devices. So any other questions or comments? I know we're kind of to the end of our end of our hour. So, and this is obvious, this is of course gonna be posted on YouTube and I'll, I'll post the, uh, the PDF as well on the uh, purple WRT list. So. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, I I hope it was uh was interesting to folks. Um and uh, uh I am either going to be speaking on this, hopefully I'll submit a talk for the to OpenWRT Summit, um, whether it'll be by myself or a joint talk with Matt, um, because Matt obviously knows it better than I do because he wrote it. Um it, one of the other will submit a talk and hopefully speak on that if it's accepted. So, um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Th What's that? I, I think it's going to be easy to, uh, for you to submit a talk and then and 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 then accept it yourself. <laughs> well, Sorry about formally, that. the community has to or the committee has to accept it. So, yeah, yeah, that's I, right. 
I suspect it will not, not be a difficult one to get accepted because it's an interesting topic. Um, but yeah, so, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, please do, if, you, if you're interested in talking at OpenWRT Summit, please submit your talk uh, before tomorrow. We, we might extend the deadline if the committee feels that's appropriate. And I think that's probably likely because there are a few um, proposals that are still sitting out there, I think, that people had a delay on. Um, and uh, if you have any questions on that or anything else, please let me know. Right. Cool. Thanks very much. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.